This case takes place in the south of Wales on the 6th of November 2014. Located in the Valley of South Wales sat the Sir Howie Arms Hotel. It offered a modest retreat comprising of nine rooms. These accommodations included five double rooms, three singles and a family room. But in the recent years, the hotel had taken on an additional role in the community. The council had repurposed it as a facility for temporary accommodation, especially for those released from prison or facing homelessness. And it's here where 34-year-old Matthew Williams was living. Matthew was the eldest of four brothers. His early years were marred by family disruptions, including his parents' divorce when he was just 10, and by the age of 11 he was smoking cannabis. By 13, Matthew had been expelled from school due to his involvement in physical altercations, and by 15, he had abandoned the formal education system entirely and dropped out of school completely. Despite several attempts to seek help for his escalating substance issues as a teenager, Matthew found it nearly impossible to control his habit. This struggle paved the way for a prolific life of crime, resulting in his first custodial sentence in a young offenders institute at the age of 15. Over the years, Matthew's criminal record accumulated, tallying 26 convictions for a staggering total of 78 offences. His offences range from assaulting and wounding with intent to drug and weapons related charges. In April of 1997, Matthew had been referred to a mental health service following charges of burglary and attempted theft. But his admission into this unit was brief, as he violated the unit's drug-free policy by using illegal substances only two and a half hours into his admission. Despite this new law, Matthew's criminal activities and substance use continued to dominate his life, resulting in numerous stints in and out of jail. In 2004, Matthew received a diagnosis of schizophrenia, a mental health condition that would later be disputed by mental health professionals. He was subsequently admitted to a psychiatric unit under the Mental Health Act. However, this period of care came to an end in February of 2005. When Matthew was sentenced to five years in prison for burglary, theft and wounding offences. Further burglary offences led to another prison term in 2009. During his later stays in prison, Matthew was prescribed medication to address his mental health issues, which included hearing voices, experiencing hallucinations, and extreme paranoia. These issues were only exacerbated by his substance abuse. Unfortunately, Matthew did not consistently adhere to his prescription medication regime and often refused treatment. He cited various reasons for his non-compliance, including side effects and doubts that the medication was effective. In 2014, his prescription was ultimately terminated after a lack of reported symptoms. And according to professionals, he was functioning well. Remarkably, he even managed to secure a job as a prison barber, displaying a pleasant and polite demeanor in the run-up to his release. Upon completing his 27-month sentence, Matthew was released from prison without the usual statutory need for supervision, without medication, and without a referral to the community mental health team. His release was conditional upon his commitment to contact his general practitioner should any mental health conditions arise. When he was released, he was offered voluntary support for substance misuse, employment, and housing, but Matthew declined citing his wariness of the police and probation over the years. It's at this point that Matthew was granted a room at the Sir Howie Arms Hotel, but shortly after arriving, he began to struggle with his mental well-being. His mother, Sally Ann Williams, would later assert that her son had been experiencing hallucinations, including disturbing visualizations of faces in everyday objects. He claimed that a can of Coca-Cola had turned into a face. These signs of mental distress painted a grim picture of the state of his psyche in the days before a gruesome attack. On a night out in October, Matthew met a 22-year-old woman named Keris Yem. Keris worked as a saleswoman at a clothing store called Next and was described as an outgoing person. Those who knew her described her as a fun-loving young woman full of life. Keris had been a student at Oakdale Comprehensive School and was studying health and social care at Cross Keys College. But Keris wasn't without her own set of struggles. 
A former boyfriend named Matthew Heyman had been arrested after she broke up with him in October of the previous year. Heyman had tried to take his own life after the breakup by setting his house on fire. He had lit up his bathroom and turned on the gas cooker. It was a miracle that his house didn't explode. He eventually admitted to arson and was imprisoned for three and a half years. After meeting on a night out, Keris and Matthew began talking and exchanged a number of text messages. One of Keris's ex-boyfriend had been in prison with Matthew. It's reported that he had advised her to stay away from Matthew, indicating that he may have had concerns about the potential danger he posed. On the evening of the 6th of November 2014, Keris met up with Matthew in the Sir Howie Arms Hotel. She went up into his room, and it would be the last time she was ever seen alive. Mandy Miles, the proprietor of the hotel, dialed 999 after hearing screams coming from Matthew's room. She opened the door of his room to find Matthew stabbing Keris's body with a screwdriver and eating her face. She shouted to him, What are you doing? Are you eating her? She went on to say that there was a large amount of blood and compared the scene to a horror movie. Matthew briefly stopped and looked up at her with blood dripping from his face and a crazed, vacant look in his eyes. After staring at Mandy for a moment, he went straight back down to Keris. Mandy immediately called the emergency services again to tell the police that she believed it was a cannibal attack. She shouted down the phone, He's shoving a screwdriver in her face. He's chewing her face. Matthew was covered in blood. It was around 1.40 a.m. when the police arrived at the hotel. They tried to talk to Matthew, ordering him to stop, but when he failed to respond to their request to move away from her body, officers were left with no choice but to tase him. Matthew was swiftly arrested and placed in handcuffs. He tried to get up again, but officers tased him another three more times in the space of 20 seconds. Shortly after, Matthew became unresponsive and died. This hostel for homeless people and some ex-offenders is now a crime scene. Keris Yem was a young woman with her whole life ahead of her, but the shop assistant who lived locally was killed in the most horrifying way, described as an act of cannibalism. She had met 34-year-old fitness fanatic Matthew Williams through friends. He was a man with a violent past. Responding to reports of a disturbance, a single female police officer was the first to arrive here in the early hours of yesterday morning. What she saw was traumatic. Along with fellow officers who attended the scene, she's been offered counselling. Matthew Williams had been living in this hostel after being released from prison a few months ago. He'd served almost half of a five-year sentence after being convicted of assaulting a former girlfriend. Tonight, questions are being asked about why a man with such a violent past was living in this residential community. It was later determined that Keris's cause of death was sharp force trauma to the head and neck. She died as a result of external blood loss and internal bleeding. Home office pathologist Richard Jones said he carried out the post-mortem on Keris's body and found 24 separate areas of injury, which included at least 89 separate injuries that he could count, which included blood force trauma, biting and cutting. He said there were injuries to the eyes, including the removal of the left eye, nose, ears and mouth, with the injuries to the mouth being the most serious. Despite the bite marks and a large amount of blood around Matthew's face, the coroner claimed that Matthew didn't actually consume any of the flesh. Despite this, the attack was described as cannibalistic. Those who witnessed the attack would later say that Matthew appeared to be possessed and that any attempts at reaching him were futile. Authorities believe that he was in the middle of a schizophrenic episode, made worse by the cocktail of substances and binge drinking in the days prior to the attack. In the aftermath of the horrific murder, an inquest into the events surrounding the tragic incident was held to determine whether or not the police were at fault for the death of Matthew. Matthew's mental health struggles and his interactions with mental health services as well as his criminal history were discussed. 
The inquest also delved into the events leading up to the fateful encounter between him and Keris. It was ultimately found that Matthew Williams met his end as a consequence of a sudden, unanticipated fatality due to the combined effects of substance use and resistance to restraint. Keris' family and her mother have said that the death of Keris is unbearable and described her as a kind and caring person that could always see the best in people. Matthew's mother, Sally Ann Williams, said her son had been diagnosed with schizophrenia after claiming he was a tree and saying that his food was poisoned. She said that after his release, there was no mental health support whatsoever. He told her that he had been released without any medication. She added that Matthew had complained that the voices were back in the days before the killing.